Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another pen pending cocktail class series. Uh, my name is Dorian. Today we're going to be talking about vermouths in specific. Uh, we have a very cool brand and a very cool team today. Uh, also followed by Philip Duff. So today we're working with Cuchillo. Uh, they are a vermouth brand. They specialize in Bianco, white vermouth, uh, Rosso, which is gonna be their red, and a dry vermouth. Uh, so today we're going to focus on and work on classics such as the El Presidente and the Martinez. Uh, very much looking forward to this class. I think what the brand brings is pretty unique. We'll find a little bit more about them as well. What maybe makes them stand out from a traditional and what might make them become a little bit more of a contemporary brand as well. Uh, going forward, again, Philip Duff will be hosting the class and very much looking forward to it. Uh, I thought today would be fun to start off with a uh, classical El Presidente cocktail. Uh, this cocktail is pretty fun because it does primarily have like a heavier amount of uh, white vermouth inside. And I thought it would be cool to kind of showcase uh, the vermouth we are using today. So again, a little bit of a background on this classic cocktail. It originally started in Cuba. Uh, Cuban bartenders were kind of just messing around with more like Rum spirits, of course, and they were playing with lime and cane sugar. And ideally they wanted to come up with something a little bit different this time. So back in 1912, they kind of thought, let's do something a little bit more spirit forward. And that's also containing white vermouth. So traditionally for this cocktail, uh, we want to start with orange bitters. So you, I would go ahead and start with a couple dashes of those. It's going to be a quarter ounce of orange Curacao, or in this case, any orange liqueur you can get your hands on. And just a touch of grenadine syrup. So in this case, you can also just use like half a bar spoon. That's okay to totally use, just to give it that nice, sweet little note. And so the vermouth we're using today is going to be Cuchiello. This Bianco vermouth is really special. It has notes of crisp apple, cardamom, and elderflower liqueur. And this will be an ounce and a half. It is very Bianco heavy and will also be classically known as aged rum as the base spirit. So the rum I'm using today is going to be Diplomatico Mantuano. This is one of my personal favorites. It's got notes of toffee and vanilla. So I think this would add really nice to the notes of the crisp apple, the cardamom and the elderflower. So again, a little bit more of the background for this cocktail. Again, Cuban bartenders were looking for something a little different than drinking like a traditional daiquiri. Um, and the name also, of course, El Presidente is pretty cool in itself. So the president at the time was Mario Garcia, Garcia Cantinero. And he was the president from 1913 to 1921. So this is gonna be a stirred cocktail. Ideally, you wanna stir this drink for about 15 to 20 seconds. Of course, you can go a little bit more if you'd like, depending on how you like your dilution. But ideally, that is about the safe mark to go ahead and start with. And traditionally and classically, we are going to serve this cocktail in a Nick and Nora glass. and topped off with an orange zest. And there you have the El Presidente. Hi everyone, welcome to Patent Penning. If you guys haven't been here already, uh, usually we conduct our cocktail classes here. 
Of course, as you can see, it's a bit fuller than normal, which I'm super stoked about because this is really awesome. Uh, today we're doing our vermouth series. Uh, we have something really special in hand for you guys. Uh, so today I'm going to introduce Philip Duff and Sarah. They are with the Cuchello team. Uh, welcome them, everybody. So uh, Sarah and Philip are going to give a little bit more detail on what we're about to learn today. Um, Sarah, if you'd like to. Yeah, thank you, Dorian. First of all, thank you so much, Patent Pending, for hosting us. Hey. This is phenomenal. Yeah. And to be a part of the biggest and largest class that we've had here is also phenomenal. So thank you guys for all showing up. Uh, my name is Sarah Cercia. I'm from St. Killian Importing. We're the proud importer of Cuchillo Vermouth, and we're so thrilled to have you guys here. We've just started working with this brand not a few months ago. It's been a long time coming, and the fact that you're here to learn more about vermouth as a category, in addition to having Cuchillo be the, the star, is phenomenal. So again, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. We do have gift bags for you before you leave, so remind me, find me. Um, <laughs> clearly, you all love vermouth, and I think that that really goes to show with the turnout that we have here today. So again, thank you. And it's really, really a pleasure to have Philip Duff, the owner of Cuchilla Vermouth, Andy Lorenzo here. Um, phenomenal. Like I, I don't have to give Philip any type of introduction, but he's been an industry maven, I think, to all of us. He knows so much. He's so knowledgeable. We've known each other for years. So thank you for everything you've, you've done for the community and the industry. Um, and so to have him here as part of the Cuchillo brand and help us really kick this off and launch this and have you guys even more educated about everything is great. So thank you, Philip. Um, and then I just want to say, Andy, you've been such a, a wonderful and a pleasure to work with, the owner of Cochilla Vermouth. Um, this was his brainchild. You know, he really thought of this brand and everything about this brand is beautiful. Everything from the packaging to everything that you'll taste today. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to ask, especially pricing. We're distributed through uh, Blueprint Distributors in case you guys need to know that. Um, but thank you so much for everything. And um, without further ado, Philip. Let's do it. All right. Hey, man. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, we're filming this. So I'm going to need all of you to sign a release afterwards. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking about vermouth. I've been teaching about vermouth for over 20 years. If you work in a bar, own a bar, drink in a bar, after spirits, it's the most poured uh, liquid in your bar. And there's some discrepancies in its legislation all around the world. So I'm gonna do the history bit. History, context, bit of mixology. I'm gonna hand over to Andy for the brand and the tasting. Right, in along the way, we're gonna have a nice little surprise snack. We're gonna have a cocktail afterwards, and then Lorenzo's gonna make us samples of cocktails so you can try it in a groni, you can try it in a few other drinks as well. And as I say, you're welcome to stick around afterwards with us uh, and try a bit more, taste a bit more, have some other cool stuff, all right? Sweet? All right. So, vermouth. This is the uh, vermouth series from Cuchello. They've just done a tour in Italy with my friend and vermouth educator Fulvio Piccinino, who's written a stunning book on vermouth that you should definitely try and get your hands on. Um, we're doing this here and we're doing a little thing tomorrow, we're doing a thing in Miami and it's really the first communication with the bar community here in the USA. Because America is one of the largest consumers of vermouth in the world and uniquely it's almost all in cocktails. In all the other big consumers, uh, believe it or not, Russia, until about a year ago, was one of the biggest consumers of vermouth in the world as well. Uh, but it was mostly drunk straight or in a simple long drink, right? And in Spain, anyone ever been to a vermuteria in Barcelona or Madrid? You know, they've got like big suckling pigs hanging up. You've got draft vermouth and beers. It's awesome, right? But we don't fuck with that shit <laughs> here in America. We, we drink it by the Manhattan and by the Martini, right? And the Boulevardier and the El Presidente. So I've been teaching 
for more than 10 years what we call the Vermouth Institute. It started off as uh, six hours of seminars, three back-to-back -back seminars at Tales the Cocktail. Uh, there's all the hashtags and uh, socials if you want to take photos and tag us and all that. And what I've seen already coming out is the El Presidente. Uh, I adore this cocktail. It was invented, no one's really quite sure by who, but it was first popularized by a Spanish bartender in Cuba. And he was using uh, Cuban style rum back then, which was aged, but then carbon filtered. So it looked clear, but tasted aged, much like Cristalino tequila is today. Uh, the closest uh, analogues of that today would be things like, for instance, Banks or Florida Canyon or whatever. So, you know, Bacardi literally used to be better back in that day. <laughs> Most of the drinks that came from the Caribbean were the holy trinity of rum, lime and sugar, or rum, some citrus and sugar. This was the first one to break the mold. Right? And for years and years, whenever you made it from an uh, old cocktail book, it tasted like ass and not in a good way. Because people made it with dry vermouth. And it's not until about 10 or 12 years ago that historians, including New York's finest, Dave Wondrich, worked out that it was made with Bianco vermouth, which is the semi-sweet, clear version. And Bianco vermouth's a bit of a unicorn in America. You can get it, it's not big. It is, however, just about the biggest style worldwide. America, yet again, is exceptional in not drinking very much Bianco Vermouth. In other, like when I bartended in Holland 20 years ago, the Martini company actually had an RTD. They had Martini Bianco with a uh, bitter lemon, like lemon juice and tonic water. That's how big it was, right? And the reason it has never sold well here is that they have never pushed it. And the reason they don't push it is it's never sold well here. So when you travel abroad, you'll see loads of Biancos and the Cuccello Bianco is fucking stunning. So, as you can see, it's essentially a Manhattan riff, more or less, equal parts, with a spoon of orange curacao, and we've gone with half a spoon of grenadine. Some of the old recipes had a full spoon of grenadine, but they're using dry vermouth, so obviously screw that. Please uh, give me one of those drinks, and uh, tell me <laughs> what you think of it. I, lo I love the way the people at the back are getting the drink first. All right. On to the education portion. This is put together by Martin Duderoff. He's the guy behind vermouth101.com, oldfashion101.com. Uh, he builds cocktail apps for people like Attaboy and Robert Simonson. He is the historian at Cocktail Kingdom of Greg Bohm and Greg's dad's immense library of books. And he put this together more than 10 years ago. It's almost impossible for you to read because uh, the lights are on because we're filming. But there are uh, aromatized wines in the world. That's wine with some kind of herb or spice in there. The most famous one is Barolo Quinato, which is Barolo with quinine in it, or for the Americans, quinine, right? There's uh, Vino Amari, and there's one or two others. So wine with something in it. And then there's fortified wines. These were largely invented to A, stop wine going off, in hot places, or B, stop wine going off on long sea journeys. So sherry and port and Madeira and Pinot de Chiron, they're all essentially fortified wines. We're not dealing with any of that today. We're dealing with wines that are fortified and aromatized. If you fortify a wine with distilled alcohol and you aromatize it with vermouth, Sorry, with wormwood, there's going to be a lot of that today. Uh, with wormwood, it's called vermouth. Wormwood in German is wermut. And when drinking it became popular in France, they called it vermouth. And then the Italians actually adopted the French way of spelling and pronouncing it. Right? So wermouth actually means literally man courage, in case you're wondering. Right? And if you've tasted vermouth, uh, or indeed wormwood, you'll know why they say that. We have some fresh wormwood here and actually two different types to try afterwards for the brave among you. If you fortify a wine with alcohol, distilled alcohol, and 
principally uh, quinine, it's called a quinquina, right? The most famous of which, of course, is Burr, Grand Quinquina. And if you fortify a wine with distilled alcohol and you aromatize it uh, with gentian, it's called an Americano, not to be confused with the coffee of the same name, or indeed the cocktail. Famous uh, Americano-style drinks would be uh, Sue's, for instance, a famous kind of a gentian drink. But we're zooming in on vermouth because, you know, I don't have six hours today. I have to assume you've all got somewhere to go. And let's talk a little bit about where they all fit in. We call aromatized wines and fortified and aromatized wines aperitif wines, something to wake up your system, your uh, digestive juices, get them, get them going. Now, for some of you, that could be a pint of Guinness. For me, it's a martini. But historically, these bitter, almost pre-mixed cocktails were what you had prior to a meal. Hence, uh, l'ora de vermouth, the hour of vermouth before dinner. That was their cocktail hour. And indeed, seriously, even the bartender's got a fucking drink. Uh, only been here since 10.30. Cheers. Cheers. Nice one, Lorenzo. It's taught that the first cocktail ever drunk in America wasn't a cocktail in the sense that, well, first of all, the word uh, hadn't existed. When George Washington was negotiating with the English for the English surrender, right after they lost, creating America, um, they were negotiating in upstate New York. And uh, he pulled out his watch at about five o'clock and he said, let us retire for wine and bitters. Now, back then, wine meant almost any kind of alcohol. It could have been whiskey, it might have been Geneva, it didn't really matter. But alcohol and bitters was how you described it. And he was drinking it at exactly the right time. So we're not sure exactly what they drank, but it might have been the first drink of America after the English fucked off was something along the lines of this. Now, there's lots of different ways to classify vermouth. Uh, the Turin style is heavy, red wine, spicy. The uh, French style, Marseille, is epitomized by Noir Prat, and it's oxidized and saline and aged in barrels by the seaside, right? The new or new Western... Uh, oh, yeah, sure, that'd be lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Literally the last person in the room. <laughs> Yeah. This is fantastic, isn't it? This is a drink you'd be very proud to put on your menu. It's a great name. Like El Presidente is one of the better names. Apparently it's named after a president of Cuba who really liked this drink. And frankly, I think most presidents would be better off if they had a few more drinks. Uh, um, one of the categories I'd like to point out, or subcategories in Turin, is a la vanilla. We're going to get into how it was invented, but it was invented in and around the area of Turin, Chambéry, called Piedmont. And it was hugely popular. And just like people will come into your bar and they say, oh, could you make me that cocktail but with mezcal? Or can you make me this? They want adjustments, right? And that's cool. They would say, for instance, uh, I'll have vermouth, but I want you to add some bitters to it, right? A point and a half, they would call it, right? Because stockbrokers ordered it. And they used to say points and a half, meaning vermouth and bitters. And that evolved into punt y mess, right? Which is a vermouth with extra bitters, right? They would also ask for it with a bit of vanilla in it. Because vanilla was like tobola mezcal back then. It was proof that you were balling, right? So if you asked for your vermouth with vanilla a la vanilla, it would be, oh, right, the only brand around pretty much now that truly is vermouth a la vanilla is Carpano Antica formula, right? So complaining about Carpano Antica formula being really sweet and vanilla-y, right? It's like saying that Lamborghinis are too Italian. It's supposed to be like that, right? It's not like they've, well, it is like they've sweetened the regular uh, vermouth and added vanilla, but it's a category of its own. So knowing what the categories are, uh, Chambéry from the French city, which is also where Bianco Vermouth was invented. We'll get to that in a moment. But basically, know your categories. 
This is the uh, production uh, diagram from the Consortium of Vermouth Torino producers. And it just explains in a very simple way how you make vermouth. You start off with wine. Traditionally, the wines of your region, right? So, for instance, uh, Noy Pra, uh, south uh, eastern France on the coast, a lot of Picpoul and Claret, kind of dry white wines. Around Chambéry, semi-sweet. Northern Italy, powerful, rich things. Think Barbaresco, right? You need some fortifying alcohol. Typically, you just get some of that wine and distill it. You're going to need some sugar. And the reason you're going to need sugar is you're going to put some really bitter stuff in there. You're going to put in wormwood. You're going to put in gentian. You're going to put in aloe. Whatever. The bitter stuff needs something to counteract it. Right? You marry all those things together. You might barrel age them common with Vermouth di Torino, and then you filter it and you bottle it. It's very simple, but obviously within that, there are a million different variations. We'll just explain some of them today. So in making those botanical ingredients part of a whole, there's a number of different ways to do it. Uh, maceration is the easiest one. You all probably do this at work. Uh, you leave some uh, herbs or other botanicals in a bottle of booze for a few days, right? When I was a young bartender, we were cutting edge because we would put a vanilla pod in a bottle of vodka, right? Which is a colorless, tasteless, odor spirit for the New York bartenders here. Uh, and then after a few days, we would have vanilla vodka. That was like, that passed from mixology in London in 1993. Uh, you can do it hot or cold. It will give a different effect, depending, right? You can percolate it. And percolating is just like doing pour over coffee. Ironic, because we're in a coffee shop. Uh, you get a great big filter and you fill it up with all the botanicals, herbs and spices that you like, and you filter the alcohol through it. And again, can be done hot or cold, gives different effects. Or of course, you can simply redistill alcohol with the botanicals, make a sort of uh, botanical distillate, if you will. You can do it in a pot still, you can do it in a hybrid still, you could do it in a rotovap still, if you've got very delicate ingredients. A key thing making any fortified or aromatized wine is blending. Some of the blending vats, this is an old one from Burr. Burr at one stage was one of the world's biggest brand, a quinquina, not even a vermouth. And they had literally a million litre blending vats, like basically this building that we're in. And how you blend, how quickly you blend is absolutely key. For instance, if you uh, blend in the alcohol too quickly or the water to bring it to the right strength too quickly, you get a soapy taste, which you don't want, right? It's called saponification. Uh, sometimes all the blending ingredients are aged separately and then combined. This is a dark art. Look on Amazon for blending books and you won't find them. It's something that isn't really taught except on the job. They're a bit ahead of us in the world of uh, wine compared to spirits. And blending recipes are much more jealously guarded than distilling recipes. So let's go way back. Everybody cool with the Presidente? Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Top work, by the way, to Dorian and Carlos and the crew here. Guys, if you can hear us, thank you. <laughs> You're out there, Andy. Now, we have been drinking wine for ages. This is actually, I've, I've never asked this question. Does anyone here hunt? Any hunters in here? Oh, come on, let's be one of you with a gun. This is America. <laughs> uh, no? All right. Apparently, yeah, that's true. Uh, apparently, one of the biggest dangers of going hunting in Canada and, and Northern America in the fall is drunken bears because the fruit falls on the ground, ferments, and the bears eat it. And then you're being chased not just by a bear, but by a drunken bear, right? Because there's yeast all around us. It spontaneously ferments. If you've ever shared a refrigerator with a bartender, then you know this. 
Right, I know fermentation is really big now. When I was a bartender, if my boss came behind the bar and something was fermenting, I would be fired. Now, if nothing is fermenting, you will be fired. So, we have been drinking wine with stuff as long as we've been drinking wine. And wine almost makes itself. Grapes and any other fruit will spontaneously uh, ferment. Historically, we did not genetically manipulate the yeast. So the wine would be like 6-8% alcohol, right? Essentially, when we're talking about uh, herbs and spice wines, we go back to the Middle East and China, right? We have wormwood wine in China in 1250 BC. Essentially, everything goes back to China. And China drank wine for banqueting for a very long time. And the only way we know they switched to spirits is because in the illustrations of banquets, the cups got a whole lot smaller, right? Distilling was almost certainly invented in China, almost certainly. So Hippocrates, the guy, the father of modern medicine, uh, wrote about wormwood wine, uh, Retsina, and the Roman Empire drank absinthium venum, wormwood wine. In fact, uh, Christ on the cross, you might have read that he was tortured while on the cross, that the, uh, the Roman guards gave him a, a stick with vinegar on it. It wasn't that exactly. It was a wormwood wine soaked stick to wash his face and to drink a little bit. It was actually a compassionate thing to do, believe it or not that they did back then. Um, to refer to Mezcal again, uh, you might know my friend Joaquin Simo, uh, noted New York bartender, inventor of the Naked and Famous, and Mezcal lover. Uh, one time he was down in Oaxaca and they were tasting a Mezcal that was made in the uh, Palenque there. And he said, you know, I've always noted roses. I've always got like an aroma of roses in this Mezcal. And the guy started laughing, the distiller. So they went outside and in among the rows of agave were roses, just, just growing wild there. And that was why he had always noticed it. The same is true. If you plant wormwood near grapevines, the grapes will taste of wormwood, which isn't actually good because just grapes and wormwood is, is bitter and it's, it's nasty. But from 500 AD onwards, scientists, most of the monks, were trying to find uh, the fifth element, transubstantiation, eternal life. They failed, but they codified and wrote down distilling. And distilling showed up in Europe after a long trip. It was almost certainly invented in China. Who traded with China back then? Arabs. The Silk Road led from China all the way through the Middle East, up through North Africa, into Europe. The middle point where we talk about distilling being invented like Iraq and all that, that's just because it's convenient to us. It was almost certainly invented in China. Now, the Arabs very kindly brought their knowledge to Europe by invading most of it, right? Starting in 711. They controlled all of Spain, all of Portugal, the bottom half of France, uh, good bits of Italy, and the local people uh, weren't thrilled about this, but they got a lot of amazing knowledge. That distilling knowledge came into Europe and it was translated into European languages like Latin. Have you ever heard people saying that like distilling was invented in Salerno in Italy? That's a common one. And the Spanish like to say it was invented in Toledo. It wasn't invented in either of them. Those were the most famous translation schools of their time where people would translate from Arabic to English. Now, before that, the Chinese were very uh, cautious about drinking. The most important part, you would never drink alcohol on your own. You drank it in a banquet. There was a Toastmaster. Uh, if he saw that people were a bit, bit uptight, he'd raise more toasts. And if you saw people getting a bit too loose, he'd slow it down. The Europeans didn't really see it that way, right? The Arabs used alcohol to make eyeshadow. That's why uh, the word coal for like mascara is the same word root as alcohol, all right? The Europeans, however, did not use it to make eyeshadow, right? <laughs> they used it to make distilled spirits successfully. And this is one more piece of the puzzle that became vermouth. Now, 
The Renaissance happened from about 1300 onwards, right? It coincided with the printing press, with uh, a discovery or rediscovery of things like Arabic knowledge and mathematics and distilling. And Arno de Villeneuve, the father of modern chemistry, he was an alchemist, uh, but he had wormwood wine recipes in his favorite, uh, his most famous book, Liber de Vinum. And the word wormwood showed up, right, in 1400 in English. So that's, that goes back a good bit. Now, if you study vermouth at all, this place will keep coming up. The Kingdom of Sardinia, which is quite a long way away from Turin and Chambéry, which are the home cities of Vermouth. So why do we talk about the Kingdom of Sardinia? The Kingdom of Sardinia was kind of given to the Duke of Savoy, who owned these lands. And some people began to call it the Kingdom of Sardinia and Piedmont, a name for the region. Uh, and by 1720, it was all ruled by the same dude. And as you can see, inside the border you have Chambéry and Turin. This is really important. Italy didn't exist back then. Didn't exist. Didn't exist as a country till 1861. It was the last country in Europe to get its shit together. Right? Uh, so as soon as it became Italy, Chambéry was in France. All of Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, all of uh, Italy was this kind of Game of Thrones interlocking patchwork blanket of kingdoms and duchies and all this sort of thing. In the end, by the way, the Duchy of Savoy became the top dog and unified the rest of Italy and it became Italy. You can also see, historically, it's not that far from Marseille, right? So we've kind of got a triangle here. Marseille, where dry vermouth was invented. Turin, where... Sweet vermouth was invented, and Chambéry, where Bianco vermouth was invented. In 1555, uh, a guy called Geronimo Rosselli, one of the better names in vermouth history, uh, wrote a book, and it was a book about vermouth and how to make it. And it was called The Secrets of the Reverend Alessio Piemontesi. Why did he use a pseudonym? Because he would have been killed by the Catholic Church if he didn't. Uh, they wanted to lock down all knowledge of uh, distilling and anything that could give them power. So writing those things down, publishing it, uh, uh. Mr. Rochelle, uh only felt safe having it available in, uh, under a pseudonym. But this was the first large-scale book that taught people, after the invention of the printing press, how to make vermouth. Fortified and aromatized wines spread around the world, particularly was two companies. The Dutch East India Company, the Verenigd Oost Indisch Company, uh, a sister branch of which founded the new Amsterdam colony, which is where we are now, stretched from here to Rhode Island in the north, Pennsylvania in the south. Uh, they founded the first distillery in America on Staten Island. Uh, the Geneva that they brought over with them led to the creation of rye whiskey, America's first whiskey. And England saw that and they're like, that's a brilliant idea. And they started the East India Company. Um, a relatively small company, country in Europe wound up ruling half the world, including all of India. If you've ever uh, worked, has anyone ever worked in an office? Any office refugees here? Yeah, it kind of sucks. And the reason is these guys invented the office. They invented bureaucracy. They had vast buildings full of people just copying ledgers from one to another. because They needed that level of organization to rule half the world and make sure the taxes were paid and the ships were full and all that kind of thing. It was wild. The very famous English writer Samuel Pepys wrote about Pearl, which is a kind of a wormwood wine cocktail, as long ago as 1659. For context, the word cocktail didn't show up till about 1801. And then in 1786, Antonio Benedetto Carpano made the first brand of vermouth called Carpano. And it was so beloved by the uh, royals of Turin, where he operated, that they said this. This is what 
we drink. It's like Taylor Swift going to your restaurant. You know, it's going to be full all the time after that. They're like, this is what they drank. And they actually dropped the other products uh, that were the court favorites then, like Rosolio, in favor of vermouth. And they called it vermouth because the Duchy of Savoy was in a relationship, if you will, uh, with Germany, right? They were kind of allied with Germany against their Italian rivals in the other kingdoms and fiefdoms and shit like that in the south. So they were kissing ass, basically. And like I said, the Italians later on adopted the French way of saying and spelling it, vermouth, right? So there was vermouth being made before Carpano, but it wasn't called vermouth. It might be called wormwood wine, uh, many, many other things. The Germans and Hungarians drank wormwood wine too, but Carpano gets the nod, basically, because he got the nod from uh, the royals. And they outlawed, actually, the serving of other products. By 1806, the word vermouth was in English. Like, now we're cooking. First they had wormwood, now they have vermouth. So we know the English are drinking vermouth. Only, what, 22 years later, which back then was nothing. And in 1813, Noi Prat is invented. First in Lyon, and then they move down to Marseille. And as you can see from the map, it's not even that far, even if you have to travel by horse uh, from Chambéry and Turin. So Chambéry and Turin are where vermouth was born. The first vermouth that was called a vermouth that had a brand was invented in Turin, Torino. All right? And you didn't even need to ask what was in it because of course they used the local wines, which are spicy, rich, red Italian wines. It was quite sweetened because if you didn't have vanilla, showing off how much money you had, how much bling was done with sugar. Sugar cost a shitload back then, right? It was, the, it was the most expensive spice you could add to your food. So putting sugar in your vermouth just showed off that you were balling out of control. Pratt wanted to go a different route. He noticed that wines oxidized on sea journeys and he thought, I can use this. So he invented an oxidized type of vermouth wine, wormwood wine, and aged it in barrels. Probably why they moved the whole shooting match down to Marseille. And so Noir Prat invented dry vermouth. Right? Uh, there's different versions of Noir Prat available in America. There's an extra dry. Uh, I advise you to have the French one instead. They do make now, uh, Noir Prat Rouge, right? And everybody, in fact, makes every type of vermouth. If you read the old cocktail books, they'll talk about from the 1800s, they'll say, oh, French vermouth, they mean dry vermouth. Italian vermouth, they mean sweet vermouth. It only gets muddy when other people entered the chat, as it were. Genoa spread a whole lot of vermouth around the world. Vermouth was the first global export product of Italy. And they were exporting it before Italy was Italy. That's how old it is. This slide is from Fulvio Piccinini, Piccinino, my friend, who wrote The Vermouth of Turin, which is the best vermouth book in English. And one of the two or three best vermouth books that you can get, right? There's another one called uh, The Big Book of Vermouth, by Francois Monti. It's currently still only available in Spanish, but if you can read Spanish, you can probably read that book. This one, however, is in English and it's excellent. And Genoa was a maritime republic. It wasn't under the rule of a king or a queen. It operated as a business, right? Like the Dutch East India Company. So they spread Italian products to the far corners of the world. All right. So, a dude called Chavas in 1820 or so uh, started a distillery. He was an absent maker. He went to Turin. He sees everyone drinking vermouth. He's like, fuck yeah, right? I'm going to do that, right? It's like Japanese people went to Scotland. They saw whiskey. I'm like, we could do that. He moves home to Chambéry, kind of in the Alps. Wines are drier, semi-sweet, white wines, right? Not in the hot south where the reds were growing. And he starts a distillery. Right? Then they move to Chambéry proper. It becomes Dolan, which you all know. And then a few years after that, in 1881, a former employee of Dolan creates the first crystal clear Bianco vermouth. 
Dolan invented Bianco Vermouth, but their one was reported to be a golden color, like a straw color. Camoes invented a crystal clear one, right? And again, you probably think I'm hammering a bit too much on Bianco. I can't impress on you enough. Bianco probably outsells other styles, the other two styles of vermouth worldwide. It just doesn't in this, uh, this aberration, if you will, that is uh, America. And if you haven't, by the way, had Bianco Vermouth with lemon juice and tonic water, I recommend it to you highly. Uh, we are gonna have some with oysters here. Uh, which, which one did you go with in the end? Is that the Kumamoto's? Yes. Beautiful, thank you. Delicious Kumamoto's. There is an R in the month, so you're probably safe, but if not, we'll still need you to sign a release. Right. So now we've had the invention of sweet red vermouth in Turin by Carpano. We've had the invention of dry vermouth by Noir Pra in Lyon, later moved to Marseille. And now we've got the invention of uh, Bianco vermouth. So it should be like we hop, skip and jump from here to everyone's drinking martinis in Manhattans. Oh. It didn't go quite that way. Ooh, dang. Not Ooh. less, not less. Thank you. Person with the oysters, take now. Um, <laughs> go backwards and forwards between them, actually. Uh, have a little sip. This is, of course, the Bianco vermouth. Uh, always advise it be chilled. We're gonna have another tasting of this later on, so don't worry too much about it. Oh, yes. Oh, look, an oyster. Uh, Cute. You guys all know the Irish bar Swift down near Astor Place? It's named after Jonathan Swift, a famous Irish uh, writer. And one of his famous quotes is up on the wall. It's a, it, it was a brave man who first ate an oyster. Oyster bonds. That's it, oyster bonds. But this, this is a fantastic combination. I know for a lot of you, it might be the first time you've tried Cuchello. Uh, we'll come back to a full tasting of this in a moment. But yeah, some of the biggest brands that began exporting vermouth uh, aren't really around anymore. So one of the biggest, you can see from that massive billboard advertisement, was Cora. And Cora in the 1830s was exporting vermouth to places with lots of Italians. So Buenos Aires, San Francisco, London, New York, New Orleans, anywhere with a large Italian uh, population. It didn't necessarily spread outside the ethnic Italians, right? Which we know. In 1861, Italy became Italy. That meant Chambéry was in France. Boom, country in between. But remember, historically, they were part of the same country. And that's why Vermouth comes from that area, that Piedmont era. The book there, bottom right, is noted celebrity bartender, the world's first celebrity bartender, Jerry Thomas's book, published here in New York City in 1862, the world's first cocktail book. Available free on Amazon. But it didn't have a single vermouth recipe in it until the third edition in 1887. And Thomas didn't, these were not all his cocktails, probably less than a quarter of them are his, to be honest, but he had traveled more than any other bartender. He ran a bar in St. Louis, New Orleans, San Francisco. He traveled around America with like an entertainment troupe as their manager, right? And everywhere he went, he stole recipes from other bartenders and he put them all in this book. And not a single one was vermouth based until the third edition, which is in 1887, 25 years later. So that kind of shows you where it was at. Uh, in 1867, the Paris Exposition emphasized vermouth over absinthe. Absinthe was being demonized. And also there was probably a bit of political lobbying going on. People were like, oh, vermouth, vermouth's, vermouth's much more healthy. It's much more reasonable, right? Now, demand grew in America and American bartenders started, you know the way you go to different countries and do guest bartending? That's not new. Right? In, uh, what year was that? Oh yeah, the 1851, they had what they called the Exposition of All Nations at Crystal Palace in South London. And they built a vast glass 
palace there. And seeing the opportunity, maybe the world's first celebrity chef, right? Alexei uh, Sale, Soil, sorry, built a massive restaurant complex opposite the expo, right? Imagine, like you're building a massive restaurant complex opposite the Javits Center, right? And he called it uh, the, the food expedition of all nations. So they, he had like the equivalent of Disney animatronics there. He had like a Chinese area. He had an Amazon River voyage. And he had an American cocktail bar in 1851 staffed by an American bartender making these new cocktail things, right? And variously other American bartenders showed up. Uh, the first ever cocktail bar in the UK, full-time one, was the Criterion, which is in uh, Piccadilly Circus to this day. It's not the same place. And American bartenders start showing up in Paris and Germany and other places like that. And they wanted to show off the things that they were doing back home. So they brought cool ingredients with them, like vermouth. This is how the word got, gets around. It's like uh, you going to some bizarre place and bringing rye whiskey and they don't have rye whiskey. That's, that's what the American bartenders were doing. And there was no internet back then. There was no bar convent Brooklyn and there weren't trainings like this and they didn't videotape them either. So the only way you'd learn was by going to see one of these exotic American bartenders making these uh, incredible drinks. In 1879, the company that we now call Martini uh, Rossi was formed from two separate companies, and obviously they are the dominant company to this day, right? In every uh, category of uh, vermouth, they outsell the competition. And then in 1882, we have maybe the first cocktail in print with vermouth. Harry Johnson, Jerry Thomas's great rival, has a marguerite cocktail in uh, his bartender's manual. Probably We'll find out that there's an older cocktail uh, recipe with vermouth, but we haven't found it yet. All right. In 1882, uh, a cocktail that's called sometimes the Manhattan, sometimes the Martinez, and sometimes the Turf Club starts being talked about in newspapers in New York and, bizarrely, don't ask me why, Cleveland. Right? And the first report said, it's made with whiskey or gin. Which seems a bit broad, frankly. But by gin, of course, they meant Geneva. Like, oh, I don't know. This one. Which is essentially, it's my brand. Uh, it's essentially unaged rye whiskey. In fact, Geneva is what led to the creation of rye whiskey in America. So making a cocktail from whiskey or uh, rye Geneva isn't crazy. And within a year, it was settled. Manhattans with rye whiskey. Martinez's with uh, Dutch Geneva. And you cut it either 50-50 with sweet red vermouth or maybe two parts of vermouth, one part of uh, Geneva or whiskey. So this was the, the breakthrough vermouth cocktail in America, right? Uh, in 1890, Martini and Rossi came up with extra dry to try and make inroads on Noir Praz sales, particularly in uh, the USA. And a weird thing happened that no one knows about. Does anybody here have a degree in history by any chance? Wow, no guns or history. Um, I, I want somebody to go and research this, frankly. For some reason, between 18, starting in 1890, everyone in America went bananas for dry things. First of all, the dry vermouth was launched and it absolutely skyrocketed. Fireball multiplied by pinnacle whipped cream uh, to the power of mezcal. Like it was huge. Dry vermouth, who knew it? And then, dry gin. The English started taking the sugar out of their old Tom gin and sending it to America, and everyone lost their shit. And a big shift happened, actually. Back then, uh, Geneva and whiskey were huge, right? And very similar to one another in America in taste. So the dry vermouth shows up. You know when you get cool new shit in your bar, someone's like, ooh, Bacchanora. Uh, you want to put it in a cocktail, and you're like, I'll try a Bacchanora Negroni. I'll try a Sotal Manhattan. Well, the bartenders started mixing this dry vermouth with whiskey. Mm, doesn't work well. Put your hand up if you've ever had a dry Manhattan. Q, 
keep it up if you had a second one. <laughs> yeah, doesn't mix well. Dry vermouth doesn't mix well with uh, whiskey, and obviously doesn't mix well with things that taste like whiskey, like Geneva. So the bartenders were like, fuck. Doesn't mix with whiskey, doesn't mix with Dutch gin, which is what they call Geneva. Then they thought, wait a second. We've got this new dry gin shit in. Maybe the dry vermouth will mix with the dry gin. And they did, and that's what led to the martini. So rather counterintuitively, the martini descends from the Manhattan or the Martinez. And it came about because of the wild ass popularity of dry vermouth. Now, there was a louse that destroyed European grape production for over 40 years, right? Phylloxera vestatrix. And by the early 1900s, uh, it was done. They had brought in actually American rootstock, grafted it with the French and Spanish and Italian uh, roots. It was resistant to the louse. They're back to full production. Suddenly there's too much wine. This meant you could make more vermouth and the price could go down. This leads to a weird situation that we still have to this day. Vermouth is actually really difficult to make and uh, it isn't valued at the price that it maybe should be, right? And it actually all dates back to less than 120 years ago. So. Martini launched their Bianco in 1910, so not content with copying Noi Prat. They also copied uh, Camoes from uh, Delan. And then the absinthe bans started happening. And typically when absinthe bans happened in 1912, it was banned in the USA, vermouth was unaffected, right? It was banned in France. There was definitely a political lobby about it. And there was also a political lobby promoting vermouth. Uh, in 1919, the Negroni was invented in Florence. Yay! They've actually got a plaque on the wall, on the street, uh, where Casa uh, 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 Cassoni, Cassoni Bar was. I was actually there in the summer. And it's now a Giorgio Armani store, believe it or not. Uh, Count Negroni was, there's no other way for it, a dude. He was kicked out of high school for sleeping with the headmaster's uh, wife. Uh, he didn't like his stepfather, so he ran away to be a cowboy in Montana and Canada. Uh, he then came to New York and taught fencing on Madison Avenue. There was ads in the newspaper, learn fencing with Count Negroni, right? And then he moved back to Italy and lived out the rest of his life as a wealthy Italian playboy. Um, like a lot of wealthy Italians and French and Germans, he was a bit of an Anglophile. He loved English things. So he said to his bartender one day, um, I'll have an Americano, but uh, put in that, uh, that English gin instead of soda water. And that's where we get the Negroni from. He was also a legendary drinker. Um, Count Negroni, uh, his friend wrote to him from London a year after, so in 1920, saying, it's a very tasty cocktail, Negroni, but you shouldn't have more than 27 of them in a day. Which, to be fair, still good advice, right? Uh, there, the Vermouth Cassis is an amazing cocktail that was heavily promoted by Noir Pra. Uh, there's a lot of ads starting from about 1919 onwards. It's really simple, about a couple of ounces of vermouth, a uh, half ounce of a good creme de cassis, uh, maybe a little bit of soda water. Stunning, stunning drink. If you haven't had one and you haven't had one, uh, have one. America failed to learn from the rest of the world's mistakes. And in 1920, prohibition kicked in. This was not good. Uh, it was, however, the invention of non-alcoholic vermouth. A lot of producers shipped non-alcoholic vermouth to America. A lot of producers shipped alcoholic vermouth to America as well. Uh, some of the crates were labeled perishable flowers, apparently. Shows you that Italians have a sense of humor. The absinthe bans continued. Uh, Vermouth de Chambéry in 1932 got a AOC, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, in France, got protected by the French state. And then America, managing to shoot itself in the foot once more, in 1933, introduced a triple tax. Vermouth was taxed on the wine, the fortifying alcohol, and the finished product, which is, an, even by American standards, it's some really impressive taxing there. 
right? And in the same year, Gallo was founded, and Gallo's first hit product was vermouth. Gallo went hard on vermouth. America has quite a vermouth history, dating more than 100 years. So in 1936, the triple tax ended, but you weren't allowed to fortify your vermouth anymore, which is also hilariously silly, right? So people made mega strong wine, blended it with regular wine and sugar and botanicals. It was a very sweet, you know, I can't imagine the dry vermouths back then were very good. But by 1939, uh, US to imports was seven to one. The imports were winning, right? So the quality wasn't that good, but they competed on price, all right? There was a company called Vermouth Industries of America that actually became the biggest vermouth, uh, not the biggest vermouth producer in America. They sold more vermouth than anyone, including imports. They were cheap, but there you go. World War II stopped, obviously, any vermouth imports. And in 1960, this dude started popping up in ads, right? You can actually see a martini bottle there. It is, of course, Mr. James Bond. Uh, his inventor, Ian Fleming, drank a vast amount, even by English standards. And there's a brilliant interlude in one of the books. Which one is it? Oh, yeah, Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, Bond comes here to New York. And he hooks up with his mate Felix Leiter from the CIA. And they go to Sardi's down in Times Square. And they go upstairs. And Bond goes to take a piss. And when he comes back, his mate has ordered two martinis and they've arrived. You know, it's like in the movies where someone says, two martinis, and they're there like in a second. Right? So they're there. Bond picks it up and tastes it. And he goes, oh my God, what, what is that? And Leiter goes, yeah, it's made with a domestic vermouth, Cresta Blanca. What do you think of it? And Bond's like, it's the best I ever tasted. There was actually a brand called Cresta Blanca from California. And a, they won some kind of a contest. And they did an absolute advertising blitz all across America in the mid-1950s saying, Cresta Blanca, best tasting from, you know, like Grey Goose do, that kind of thing. And Fleming was in America at the time. He was writing a travel book, actually, called Thrilling Cities a guide to cities in America. So he definitely saw the ads and Bond spoke uh, quite a bit about vermouth. This is an ad from Noir Pra from the same, uh, same era. It's like, basically, don't be an asshole. Use a good measure of Noir Pra. Don't, it actually says, don't be a sadist, right? Because they already saw that thing of like, ooh, you know, just to drop a vermouth, to put the vermouth in, swirl it around, throw it out, or, you know, uh, Hold your glass in the direction of France. That's what Winston Churchill used to say. You don't put vermouth in a martini. You just pour the gin and look towards France. That's how much vermouth you put in. English humor. Yeah. So in 1991, we get the first definition of vermouth in the EU. The first legal definition. It's called EU 160191. We get the first New modern New World vermouth in America in 1999 via, and we get Carpano Antica formula in 2001. So Carpana is a vermouth di Torino alla vanilla. It is not Antica. Clearly, it's uh, 22 years old. Now the EU regulation is quite straightforward. You've got to use Artemisia, some strain of Artemisia. Andy, would you mind uh, jumping in here? Yeah, sure. So we've got some little smuggled in jewels that we're going to pass right around. And it's with uh, it was Fulvio two weeks ago. And these are uh, a range of all the different tinctures that uh, Fulvio has made. He's got a garden of, of botanical and herbs. And here what we're going to share with you now is a distilled version of the gentle Artemisia, Absinthium, and the, and the Roman uh, Artemisia which are fundamental to Di Torino. If you don't use it, Artemisia is not like the pronounced botanical, like London Dry with Juniper. You can't go, can't call it Di Torino. Uh, so I'm going to give the, the Roman, the punchy one to, to this young lady. And so this is just a, a, little, there's a little drop one that's going to go in the palm of your hand, just to give you, the, these, these really are here to give you a feeling of the spectrum of bitterness and the different, the different types of both root and plant. As to what you can, what, what was into the different uh, styles of vermouth. So, 
And um, you should really start with this one <laughs> because, but we'll just for, for speed, we'll just do a exactly. just literally a a drop, and then if you if you uh, check your uh, you know there's a lovely smell that sits on your skin afterwards too. Um, Yes, that's why those wormwood perfumes are so popular. <laughs> so this is a gentle, huh? So I would maybe use a different hand. We've got a couple more of these too to let you see. So we can call. Good one to this. We're just going to see a face of my You know which is which. Okay. We go right here. Right on. All over. Gentle. So if you tried the Roman, now you know. And that's why we add sugar to vermouth. The Roman is really punchy. You almost need a water because it just, it quenches you. Like it really is aggressive in its bitterness. Uh, okay. So as we, as we circle around, the rest of the rules are pretty simple. Uh, it must be fortified with distilled alcohol. Duh. Uh, it can only be sweetened with sugar, sucrose, or grape must, grape juice. Three quarters of it at least has to be EU-defined wine. And it's between 14.5 and 22% ABV. So between 29 and 44% ABV. Pretty simple, straightforward definition. Uh, depending on the categorization, it has different minimum sugar levels, ranging from uh, 30 grams a liter for extra dry up to 130 grams per liter for sweet. Just for comparison's sake, the EU definition of a liqueur is a minimum 100 grams of sugar per liter. And something like, say, Saint Germain is close to 200 grams per liter. So 130 is quite a fucking bit. Then again, there's no wormwood in Saint Germain, so swings and roundabouts. Uh, there are minor delineations in the alcohol amounts, ranging from 15% for extra dry to 22% for everything else. But basically, if you remember, 14.5 to 22% is the range. You're going to be pretty much on the money. All right. Now, does anybody feel they're not paying enough taxes? <laughs> I love this. So uh, the Tax and Trade Bureau was spun out of the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms uh, Department of the American government in the 60s, late 60s, early 60s. I'm, I'm a bit fuzzy on it um, because they realized it doesn't make sense to have the alcohol people in the same building as the guns and uh, firearms people and tobacco people, although it does sound fun to me. One day, the TTB woke up and they didn't have, they realized we're in charge of alcohol and we don't have definitions of alcohol. So they really quickly came up with them. That's why vodka, for a long time, they've changed it now, was defined as colorless, odorless, tasteless. Gin was defined as predominant aroma of juniper. They just went out, looked at the top selling brands and wrote a tasting note, right? So the vodka definition is based on Smirnoff. The gin definition is based on Gordon's, and so on. But this, this is my favorite. This is the American definition, your tax dollars, at work of vermouth. Vermouth is a type of aperitif wine compounded from grape wine, having the taste, aroma, and characteristically, characteristics generally attributed to vermouth and shall be so designated. So vermouth tastes like vermouth and contains wine. Because of this, because of this, and you will have seen some of the history, right? The weird things, the triple tax, and you can't use spirits. Because of this, it's very common that American vermouth doesn't contain wormwood. And in the modern era, that's compounded because if you put wormwood in something, you have to get lab testing, and that costs about 10 grand, which is a lot for a little producer. So, Historically, American vermouths don't contain uh, wormwood. There are a rising number that do. It's always a good question to ask somebody, however. And they have to be 15% alcohol. Ba -da -ba. I think they wrote this on a Friday afternoon. 
<laughs> well, someone's like, Dave, do you have the vermouth definition? He's like, just a minute. Uh -huh. Probably, it sounds like the person who wrote it had never actually tasted vermouth. Mm -hmm. Something very exciting happened in 2019. After an astonishingly short consulting period, uh, the consortium of Vermouth di Torino producers got Vermouth di Torino recognized in EU law. To qualify as Vermouth di Torino, Turin Vermouth, uh, you have to use wormwood grown in Piedmont. It has to be between 16 and 22% ABV, and you can only use Italian wines. And there's actually a higher classification called Vermouth di Torino Superiore, which mandates all the botanicals have to grow in Piedmont. It has to be at least 17% ABV, and half the wine has to come from the Piedmont region. Now, I don't know if you've read the news, but I bring you good tidings of glad joy. Since October 2023, year of our Lord, America has recognized this designation. Literally, the press release went out this morning in the spirits business. And in order to get the American recognition, they had to prove that Vermouth di Torino has been drunk continually in America since uh, 1866. And they did. So now, uh, when you see it on a bottle in America, you know it's the real thing. Theoretically, uh, somebody in Romania could make a vermouth called Vermouth di Torino. And if the regulation wasn't recognized in America, uh, they could sell it over here. And you're like, Vermouth di Torino from Romania? Fine. Can't do it anymore. It will all be from Italy and have the exact same rules as the 2019 thing, which is awesome. Putting up a moat around your product category and being able to say, look, this is what it is and it can't be anything else is a really good thing for the whole category. So, uh, as you may have noticed in the bars that you work at, there's a shitload of vermouth brands out there now because everyone's drinking more spirits and that means more cocktails and that means more vermouth. Particularly in the US, particularly in New York City, we're having a martini boom right now, the like of which the city has not seen in 140 years. Uh, driven by whiskey and gin, vermouth sales are through the roof, right? Everyone wants to emulate Carpano Antica formula, but it sells for $30 frontline. That means if you make a Manhattan, the vermouth costs more than the whiskey, and that gives opportunities for other people. There's a lot of press being given to no and low, uh, well, low alcohol drinking, no alcohol drinking too. There's some great books out, like uh, Drink Lightly by Natasha David, who helmed Nightcap Bar here in New York City, uh, RIP, and Art of the Shim, which is a brilliant uh, low alcohol cocktail book written almost 10 years ago, actually, by a lady on the West Coast. So I'm gonna come back at the end if there's any questions, I'm your man. But I'm going to hand over to the man himself now, Andy, because he created this brand himself. I know it's like a joke, an Irish guy talking about vermouth created by a Scottish dude. Uh, Lorenzo, the only Italian in the group, is like, fuck Yeah, he's like, fuck this. Hey. He's probably going to start an Irish whiskey. Uh, but it makes sense to hand over to Andy now and get into uh, Cuccello proper and the tastings of which you've got a little bit here. So, uh, Andy, mate, there we go. go. Hey, I think we need to give a first of all a big hand to Philip, eh? This, this, this man, this man and his knowledge and the way he puts it over is like legendary. So, uh, Philip, thanks a million. Uh, it's brilliant to be with you guys. Thanks a lot. I know a lot of information, a lot of dates and things like that, but uh, uh, I'm really stoked uh, to to present to you Coachello uh, here today. Um, who had tried a Coachello before? Anna, you've tried it. Andrea's tried it. There's a few people, but the majority is the first time with Coachello, no? Um, so the whole point of Coachello was, I, I have a company called Artists and Spirits, and we look after Angostura in about 80 countries, Portobello Road Gin, the same. So we've got bitters, rum, gin, Amaro. We needed a vermouth. And having spent a couple of years in Jamaica, then Kingston, working with Appleton. Are you Jamaican? Yeah. Amazing. Where from? Uh, 
Oh, lovely. Eh? Nice parish. Yeah. Um, I love Jamaica. I ran Appleton's international business for a while. And then we and then when we were selling it, this is a good story actually. When we were selling it, when Angus Street used to own Appleton, they they, they had two guys. They had SPI, Stolich Naya, and they had um the the, the Campari team. And uh, and it was all hush hush, and you know Jamaica's a small island. And they said, right, we need we need you guys to be as, as quiet as we don't want to upset the, the locals. So Yuri Scheffler, who's in uh, who owns SPI, he's got a big super yacht parked off uh, Port Hark, and he's like going. <laughs> He sends, he phones up one of the distilleries and says, uh, does your distillery have space for two helicopters? <laughs> so the whole the whole cat was out of the bag. But bottom line, the Scotsman in Jamaica, we sold the business to Campari. I worked in Milan for two years after that. And I, and I eventually fell in love with Italy, like all you guys do, I'm sure. But I also felt there was something something special that was missing in the drinks business. I'm Scots, Scottish, as you can tell. Um, started in Scotch whiskey. But there's one really big thing, and this is the point of this Vermouth series, is about giving back because uh, I'm a keeper of the Kiwich, which the Scotch Whiskey Association for me is very special. The uh, BNIC for Cognac is, is very special. The Champagne community and how they do and how they protect. Um, it's so important that we as an industry talk about an, a category and not be scared about talking about competitors brand actively positively talk about competitors' brands because we can grow the cake bigger. But I could see that Di Torino and Vermouth, premium Vermouth, there'd been a, there'd been a shed load, there were about 10 million cases off the low end of Martini, Cinzano, Gancha that had just decimated over the last 15 years. And it was one of the few categories that hadn't had yet to properly premiumize. And shit, you're spending 30, 40 dollars a bottle on gin, like 20 years ago or 15 years ago, you would have been looking for a deal. Uh, you're now spending double the amount on tonic. You're now using a lot more, you're, in other words, you're a lot more conscious of your ingredients. So when a third or sometimes more is vermouth, why compromise on the quality of your vermouth? And if you look also at the vermouth brands that are there, you've got um, Carpano, Antica and Koki, amazing brands. I mean, wonderful. The history that I would buy, love to buy. but. They're really trade focused. They're not consumer facing. So the one thing I, I wanted to do was to, first of all, create a really good product. That's fundamental. The, the liquid's got to do the talking. But on the other side of that, I wanted to create a brand that could appeal, that could appeal to the consumer. Because a lot more, you know, with COVID and everything that's happened, people are drinking more at home. They're mixing more, more at home. And so that's what we, 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 we wanted to create. But like, like I said, there's not even an ounce, a millimeter of Italian blood in my body. Um, so I needed to find a brand truth. And the brand truth is very simply this. Um, and th there's a bird that flies from the west coast of Africa in May, all the way up through the west coast, through Spain, crosses over the English Channel and gets to the United Kingdom. The ones that make it up to Scotland and only the ones that make it up to Scotland, instead of going that way back, which you would think would be the, the most logical and fastest route to go, at the end of October, they fly over Belgium, through the whole of Italy, over the, over the Mediterranean, over back to the Congo Basin. And the bird is the cuckoo. And if you, you Google this on your YouTube or something, you can find the cuckoo. That's a migration. And they all call them different names because they're tagged. Well, not all of them, but a good number of them are tagged. So this is great. So we have the cuckoo, in Italian is cuculo. And anyone who knows a wee bit of Italian, cuculo is, uh, fanculo is, uh, is, 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 is a place you can't go, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but there's something cool about it too. The, the cuckoo's not this lovely, fluffy, little do-good bird. The cuckoo, if you know it, it steals other birds' nests. It's an aggressive wee shit bag. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and that is so, we're liking this, the kulu, kulu, the cuckoo. So we worked with, uh, to do the design creative, we worked with two guys I found actually on Instagram, but they are so cool, Oveja and Remy. They're based in Mendoza in Argentina. And I needed Latin blood to help with the, the design of a Latin product. And uh, if you find them, you should, you should check out some of their work. It's really cool, uh, Oveja and Remy. And so we, we worked on, okay, we like the cuckoo. Andy, you travel. 
Yeah, I have a team of guys that travel, guys, a load of guys in Athens at the moment for the bar show. The cuckoo is this, not this lovely, lovely thing. So we said, cuckoo, you've got, cello is in sky, so you've got a blend of cuccello. It's a brand new word. So it was like a bit of a, a, a sort of like, what, what's going on here? And, uh, but we wanted to create a product, a brand, first of all, that, that really um, represented something quite different in Vermouth. And before we knew what we were doing, Philip, you'll remember, it's, we're five years old. We launched the day one of the brand was day one of BCB in Berlin. And I remember looking around and there's, um, we had a big Angostura stand, eh? And then there was Bombay Safa there, Jägermeister there, thing in it. And I wanted, we created, I said, the concept, I want to make a giant cuckoo clock and I have the bar in the cuckoo clock. And uh, Philip kindly joined us as a, as a, I'll support you guys, but, and it was a bit of a what if moment. And since then, we've, we're now in what, 38 countries. Um, we're super stoked to be with St. Killian. Uh, and, and uh, Blueprint. Um, and we're super stoked to have wonderful people like Sarah and partners like Lorenzo and Anna who've worked with us in different things. But fundamental to this is going to be product. You can have the love, nicest looking brand, but if your product is not good, you ain't going to go too far. And so that journey took me through about four different producers in Piemont. One of them where we almost got to would have been beautiful, like a real artisan, all the sacks of all the botanicals in there. But it wasn't meant to be. And then he said, well, do you know what? You should go and speak to Carlo and Rita and Piera Vergano up at Torino de Stellati, just at Moncalieri, just outside Torino. And I actually was on the phone to Carlo and Rita this morning at six. Uh, Carlo's about 84, every day still in at the distillery. And with... A chap, God bless him, Dennis, who's no longer here. And Dennis was an amazing guy. He unfortunately got throat cancer. He was his chemist. We started on the journey of creating Cuccello, Rosso and Bianco. And we launched eventually Dry not so long ago. Now I'm going to pass, maybe if, uh, you can help me uh, with, on the, on the Bianco, there's some, so for, let's talk about, simply talk about product first of all. You tasted the, uh, you tasted the, um, the, the two types of wormwood, you know, the Artemisia, the, 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 the gentle and the Roman, really hard, you know, to get that, that to, to blend, but they've got to be there. That's the whole point of a Di Torino. But we wanted then to create with the Bianco and the dry, because they use the same formulation, except for one uh, different botanical. This is cardamom. So this is good for digestion. Um, I'll maybe, uh, and then in addition to, if you, if you could, what you have in front of you here is, uh, is Cuccello Dry, if I can give you that. And you've got, you should have lovely notes of fresh, crisp green apple, elderflower, cardamom, pink pepper. And everything that we'll put into Cuccello is natural. We won't deal with anything artificial. It's all natural ingredients. Um, so you're getting a very crisp, green, light, fresh taste. Always important to keep your vermouth in the fridge, eh? Once it's opened, you've got maybe three months. I personally like it, like what Philip was talking about with the, going, the vermouth going on the ships. I like it. I like a vermouth that's oxidized. So in fact, that's where I, I don't put my vermouth in the fridge. I keep it out and I like the, the way it develops. Um, but this one, you've got a lovely, so this we only launched about a year and a half ago is a, is a dry and what, you'll find the journey as we go through here. So on the nose, we, you've got a lovely, I think a light, light notice. But if you're looking for like a Dola or you're looking for a Noeli that's got that style, that limestone heaviness, this is, not for, this is not for you. And that's exactly why we did it. I mean, this is the lightest in the sugar, natural sugars. The, the wines that we use come from two places. Imagine this long strip of Italy, halfway down on the east coast, Trebbiano d'Abruzzo over on Sicily, uh, Grio and Ansonica. They're rich for their natural sugars, residual sugars that sit in the grape. So that is the common wine across all three expressions. Um, here you've got that, we have 27 botanicals that go in, and in, the natural flavors that go into Cuccello Dry. But at the back, you're getting a slight minerality, no? There's a, there's a dryness, no? Right, that sits at the front of your tongue, no? And one of the one of the differentiators here is this product. Is this? I'll, I'll pass this round actually because it's quite um, it's quite interesting. 
The, we all know about aloe vera and you hear about aloe and everything like that. Well, there's a, there's a plant called aloe ferox and just take, just, no, just, I would hold it and pass it around. Uh, um, you won't, you might, it's not the most hygienic, but you really want to try and taste a little bit of this. So you might want to steal a bit and taste it and just tell your partner how, you, how, <laughs> how it is. But this, this is the sap. So this comes out of the aloe, aloe plant. And this is rich in amino acids, which are very good from a, a health point of view. But this it gives you like a real punchy minerality. That's like, it's almost like a stone. It's got very little nose, but in taste, it's really, really hard. And we introduced that into the dry because the dry without it was too floral. It was too, too fragrant. If we, uh, I don't know how we want to do this, if how you're doing with the dry or but I would quite like to get on to the Bianco in just a second. Uh, have you guys still got a full glass or are you empty? You're done. Okay, we're in the US after all, eh? <laughs> you guys, I'll wait to the break out. Have we got some dry, uh, Lorenzo? Dry or Bianco? Yeah, it's Bianco, sorry. Yeah. yeah, let's pour some of that. So what you're going to, what you're going to notice with the, with the Bianco is very, very similar style as the dry. No aloe ferox. But you're going to have a, it's a real full bodied style of, uh, of, of vermouth. You, ha you guys had it with the oysters. And that is probably one of the nicest things you can do. If you balance up that sweetness, richness with the saline and the saltiness coming from the oyster. And then the best thing is if you, once you've, once you've had the oyster, put another splash of fresh Bianco in the shell. It's heaven. It's absolutely heaven. This is what the, this is what, I don't know if you mentioned it, Philip. This is what like, so when Carpano did his magic in 1786, he gave the, the king of Sardinia a bottle of vermouth. And the king loved it so much that he then served the oysters with the Bianco vermouth before his royal lunches. So this is a bit of us sort of trading, trading our past back with, uh, with, with Cuchello. The I'm going to pop this down somewhere. And da -da 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 -da, or I'll wait. In fact, I'll just take it away. Sensible choice, then. Yep, here we go. If there's, a, if there's a Bianco, I'll take one. But here, what you'll find is this one served with both the dry and the Bianco, served with a couple of blocks of ice, are like absolutely delicious. Like a real aperitif. You can have this, imagine having this on a nice warm day just before lunch, you know? Like just the block. I personally think you need a bit of the ice to, to help with the dilution to allow more of the fragrances to come out. We're at 16.8% alcohol by volume. So we're above the minimum 16%. Um, we tried 17.2, but the whole function of vermouth is aroma and there was too much spirit coming through in the, in the, in the final. So we, we brought it down to 16.8. To and that balance between what we've got is, is there. Is, is quite, you've got the cardamom, you've got the elderflower, you've got pink pepper, which if any of you uh, have never seen pink pepper before, it's, uh, this is it in here. And again, it's, it's not a spice, it's not a peppery note that it brings, but you imagine just walking in. I went into the distillery and we said, I'd love to see all the botanicals that we've got. So Carlo had, had, had laid out, it was like a sweetie shop, all the different tubs that come from, uh, of all the, 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 the different, the um, herbs and spices that we use. Which is your favorite between the Bianco and the dry? They're different, no? So obviously you've got, you've got the Bianco's a real full bodied expression, eh? Yeah, yeah. That elderflower is more pronounced than I think any other block of wood that I've tried. Like yeah. That sets, sets, uh -huh. It's it's a light bulb moment, like right? even um, in in Copenhagen, Denmark was one of our first export markets, and we work with a couple of cool guys there who do whistle pig aviation and what have you. And they we sell more Bianco in Copen in in Denmark than Rosso. It's about 60, 40 is the mix. Lorenzo, you oh. oh. so your presenter, you always got last. <laughs> The, the color that we get, so we make our own caramel, right? You're, you're only allowed to use two types of caramel in Di Torino Vermouth. Um, and we produce our own 
well, I was saying we, but the guys, Carlo and Beppe, produce their own car natural caramel up at the distillery. But what's our mission with Guccello, right? And we know, okay, we're thinking we're going to taste the Rosso in just a minute. But our mission with Coachello is like not to follow, not to just be another brand of vermouth. Our, we want to be like the most iconic vermouth on the planet. So we want to be everything that we do. The only bit of plastic that you see currently that we use, these are um, cotton paper labels. Um, what we are changing now is the insert of the cork, which uh, currently is plastic. That's going to a Suguro composite, so it's 80% recyclable. There's no plastic sleeve. Everything that we'll do in terms of the materials, the gold that we're using on the gift box is all fully recyclable. All the, the, the materials, we will avoid gloss, we'll avoid any varnishes that are not good to, to the planet. Um, and the brand is not meant to be this uh, sort of little, um, you, know, you know, we're not for everybody. We've got to have a bit of attitude. Uh, it's, and that's to go with, with Chuck. Um, we're not going to be for, for everybody. And that's absolutely fine. We are who we are, and uh, how we want to bring the brand to life is how it really we love doing this. This is our bicicleta, so we, 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 we've got about 12 or 14 of these. We're on a third shipment to Ukraine this year. We've been doing pop-ups in Lviv over in the west side of uh, Ukraine, and they really, really believe in Kuchelo. Um We're in Taiwan, we're in Malaysia, um, you know, Georgia, we actually just got the first order two weeks ago for Mongolia. And you think, shit, I mean, that's a big step. Our key markets, though, are, this is our number one focus, eh? So this is where the opportunity is So for so many brands. But we are in so many places, through our distribution, we're in so many places that uh, brands uh, would love to be. Um, this is a, we'll taste the Rosso just before we, 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 share, we showcase one of the cocktails at the end. This is a this is and this is how we'd love to work with you guys, is that we this is a, a, a great Italian restaurant in my country in my city called Eusebi Deli. You should check them out on Instagram. They've got about fifteen thousand followers. A small small compared to what you guys have, but Giovanna, the owner, she saw us and she said we we just completely cold called. And I said I want to get. And this is the best place. And over a matter of three years. We've now we've kicked we've kicked out Campari with their Cinzano, and we we activate there like there's there's no tomorrow. We do lovely um, Christmas Negronis. Um, we do summer. You'll find with one of our points is the the Cinque Seven the spritz that we that we put up. But the whole point of this, and we have one of these here in New York with uh, with Sarah wherever she's gone. But if you want, we have this to, to come along. And we won't, this is not for sampling, this is for selling. You sell off this and you have, we create a cocktail menu of this and we, we, we bring the brand to life. This is in Hamburg, um, 20 up, top menus, features there. This is in Copenhagen, Bar Deco, which is an example. These guys are, these guys are, this is like one of the best bars up in Copenhagen. And they saw Cicillo in three, four years ago and we've been working with them since. I want to taste the Rosso, Sarah, if we can. Um, are we? Are you already on the Rosso? Are you? <laughs> so this is the Rosso coming out here. Amazing, right, okay, cool. That wasn't planned, but it's planned now. So the Rosso, what you've got here is, is obviously Artemisia. So the gentle and the, and, the, and the Roman. So you've got those two pretty, one abrasive, one light. You've got the same wine base, and at that point, that's where the similarity stops. Where, what you now have is something that I, I can only refer to like is a, is a, a muskiness. There's a, there's a muskiness that, that sits within the product. You've got beautiful Calabrian orange peel, you know, so if you guys get a chance to really, really pungent orange peel that way from the south coast of Italy that's full and rich of lovely vitamin C. And so that, that gets put into, you get Kina. Kina, Kina, you guys, let's see if we've got a tincture for Kina because Kina is one of those, those tinctures that if you know, like if you, right, have, have in your head Coca-Cola and taste Kina. Because Kina is, uh, da -da 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 -da, if I can check, Kina, here. 
Kinato is uh, basically, yep. Rhubarb is another great uh, botanical that we use in, uh, in the Rosso, not in the Bianco, not in the dry. The rhubarb, the root, is again good for digestion. Some rhubarb? Some kina, sorry. Talking myself. There we go. There we go. Or maybe, can I pass that on you guys? Look after it. There you, there you go. Thanks. But within the... Have I got a rosso here? Is there a rosso? No. There's a rosso here. <laughs> here we go. There we go. This for me is the opposite of the Bianco and the dry. You're not going to, it would be unusual to have this on its own. This is a full bodied, rich, spicy. When we were looking at the creating the formulations of the products and the botanical mix, is that one was delivering on the nose, but not so much in the taste, and one was the opposite. And uh, what we tried to do is get one that balances both. So here you've got uh, 20. Eight different botanicals that, and uh, we're not going to tell you everything because that would be <laughs> that would be us. But we have, if you look at the label, Ricetta Regionale is something that's is is our trademark. So the brand is trademarked, obviously, but Ricetta Regionale is 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 a botanical formulation. So nobody can copy that. It's us. Um, each bottle is individually numbered, um, and if you look carefully at the bottle, there's a little uh, cuckoo clock with the Otempo Vola. And Il Tempo Vola is something really important to me um, and to the team. And Il Tempo Vola is about, not so much this time, but it's about vermouth time. It's a lot of vermouth. It's about the aperitivo time. And it's basically, if I go back to show you, it's about this moment here that says, you know, shit, life goes on too fast. And I, I won't tell you what my life has happened in the last six weeks, but it's not been good. But I can tell you that you've got to hit the stop button. You've got to hit the stop button and get those who are close to you, or family or friends, and who you haven't said, and sit down and chat and have a drink. And the drink, you don't want to get drunk because, you, well, maybe you do, but, uh, but, uh, but maybe you do. But the point is that with the whole point of this aperitivo moment, il tempo vola, is time flies. And too long time can pass before you haven't made that phone call. And if there's anything you're going to do after this call, after this session that we had today, give that person a phone and say, trying to hook up with them and grab it and go and have something together. Because that for us is a whole ethos of Coachello. And that for me is also why we do what we're doing like today, why we've done in Naples and whatever, is to give back. Because I've been very fortunate over my period to, to get and, and, and learn from a lot of people. But this Il Tempo Vola moment is special. And... I think anything you'll see has got to run under, run under that barrier, that banner um, of uh, Il Tempo Vola. We've got some beautiful POS. Um, you'll see, you won't see it here, but there's the, this is all hand engraved glassware. You've got the cuckoo clock that sits in the, in the, gray, in the, in the glass. You've got the, the actual bar spoon itself yeah. is here. It's got chuck. Uh, on the top, so that when you're stirring, then Chuck is doing his flight. Um, you've got a uh, ice pick, which is for you guys and not for the consumers at home. But anything that we'll do is is uh, is got to be as true to the brand, but as quality, because I will not let anything, anything out of our business unless it's on point. Uh, that can be a pain in the ass for the guys that work with me, but it's got to be done so that also the quality of the product that we'll give and share with you is going to hopefully allow you to do these things. Lorenzo's going to share, you guys should hopefully be getting a, a cocktail out just now. And then uh, when Lorenzo does that, he's going to mix, make some cocktails for you there and while, we, while you enjoy that and Lorenzo can talk to it. Um, Sarah, are we getting the, the Martinez coming out? It's coming. It's coming, great, okay. Lorenzo, Lor yeah, Lorenzo, yep. So, should we start with the 5-7, right? Yeah, go for it. 
So Cinque Sette stands for 5 to 7, and it's the time of uh, for the user that we have at the hour, which is actually in Italian aperitivo. So from 5 to 7 p.m., when the people come out from the office, they have the happy hour. And this is our actually uh, signature style of streets. So it's a uh, Cucero Bianco, Prosecco, uh, it's got some Angostura bitters, and a splash of salt, okay? So, aperitivo stands for aperire, which is the verb to open, and it's basically what's happened before you're having a dinner, right? It's the time you have a dinner, and that's it. If you want to call it, I want Hey, yeah. interestingly, sunk uh, asset in French also means five to seven, but it refers to uh, the girlfriend or boyfriend that you go to visit after the office before you go home to your partner. <laughs> so if I ever open a bar, it's going to be called sans cassette. <laughs> In Italy, obviously, it means drinking or eating something. Yeah. So with this one, what we found is that don't go light on the Bianco. Keep the Bianco quite strong. So it would typically be two parts Bianco, three Prosecco, a splash soda, and a couple of dashes of orange bitters. Um, served normally in a, in a nice high uh, wine glass, but really is like a unisex style drink. It's, uh, so we're gonna make a couple of these, we're gonna make one a, a couple of each of them and share them around and you guys can hopefully taste and see. So this is a, a great drink, you can see, we did this down at Vermuteria, which is the, the UK's probably, this is London St Pancras, um, and we did a pop up there and, oh, went down a storm so even in sort of a takeaway style drinks it's uh it's it's delicious yep normally sir serve, serve also with uh you guys if you're if you're all right to to to, to share and enjoy uh serve it typically with uh with a with a with a wedge of orange and uh, it's just a great drink for vermouth in, in the Nordics, they keep it really simple. With the Rosso, they'll drink it with tonic, or the Rosso will drink it with soda. Um, a nice low ABV option. So this is your Cinque Sette. There you go. Um, and let's go for a Mezcal Negroni. Uh, so With Grania. With Grania. Sarah, you want to talk about Grania a wee bit, no? Of course, sure. I'm the cuckoo bird, hence my hair. <laughs> Uh, so, Granja Nomada, so I mentioned earlier, I'm an importer. I have a fabulous collection of brands, Cuchillo being one of many, but Granja Nomada Mezcal is 100% Aspadine Mezcal. Um, we're making it in a, in a Mezcal Negroni with the Cuchillo Rosso tonight. This is an eight-year-old Aspadine um, coming from Takakula, the central valley of, of Oaxaca. Just two weeks ago, we've actually launched two new additional SKUs, 100% Tepazate and an, in a, uh, an ensemble of the Espadine and the Tepazate. Um, a lot of you in here are already supporters of Granja, so I thank you very, very much for your support. Please message me for all Cuchillo needs, for all Granja needs, and anything else. I'm your girl. I got you covered. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But I think when it, the first time I tasted some of this was up in Copenhagen, uh, not long after we, we launched. And the, the smokiness you're getting from the mezcal, together with the, the, the style of the Rosso, it really balances itself off nicely. It obviously got the Campari with the bitter, um, but it gives you just that something, that wee bit of an edge. I think my, mezcal, mezcal Negronis haven't really made it over to Europe yet, but they're big here, no? Yeah, yeah. It's because Mezcal is really expensive in Europe. Yes, correct. <laughs> they know the markets here, so they're keeping all their juice for you guys. You're lining me up <laughs> yeah. Um. There you go. We have the cuckoo fly here. You can see, as I said before. So Lorenzo and ourselves, together with Roberto Bracco from uh, Dante, we got to meet each other at uh, Brooklyn last year, eh, Lorenzo? One year before, right? Yeah, and. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to see with Anna then this year. What are we going for now, Lorenzo? We go for the midway, right? Midway. Uh, different colors. Yes, exactly. Good point. Yeah, go so, for blue. Eh? Yeah. Blue it is. <laughs> so the midway is simply um, um, one and a half part of like a, a Cuccello di Anco and one and a half of gin with two dashes of uh, two orange bitters. 
I believe, I don't know where is uh, the origin of this one come from, but it's like a, like a, a Milano Torino twist yeah. with gin, right? Yeah, it came out from the same group that owns uh, Blackbird in, in Edinburgh. And uh, they created this and we said, are you okay if we uh, use this? Because we, we just adore it. We've got a slightly sweet tooth in Scotland. Huh? So the balance though, but is it like a classic sort of old vintage 50-50 martini? Um, and you get that real, you need, you need the London dry. The thing I've noticed about with Coachella with Negronis, you're needing that London dry. You need that to really cut through on the vermouth. Uh, if you go into the Mediterranean, it just becomes too soft. You're needing that cut. Uh, so this is where we have. And then um, it just shows the versatility, you know, between neat on the rocks and then into moving into sort of low ABV-ish and then moving into heavy boozy. So in terms of that whole consumption moment of you, that like, tempo vola, when you're going to drink, when you're going to meet your friends, we, we sort of cover a fair spectrum. We're not going to cover every spectrum, but a good part. Right? Midway's Rachel's Midway's uh, Rachel's favourite. My, uh, have you not? No, no. This is this is a belter. It's yeah. Uh huh. Um, no, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I I personally love during the week. I love an americano, a simple nice uh, 50, fifty. Quite quite heavy on the on the Campari and the Rosso, and a good slug of soda, and a couple of dashes of orange bitters on the Negroni. Uh, on the regular Negroni, I put a couple of dashes of Angostura aromatic on there just to give it that extra bitterness to cut in. So this is a wee bit of a a silent assassin. <laughs> <laughs> As I would say, because it's so good, it can slip down before you know it. Two or three of those, and you, you're in, you're in need of help. Description: A silent assassin. <laughs> There we go. Great. That's good. Hey guys. There you go. Yay. Yay. Anna. Yeah. Keep on, keep on handing out. Yep. Oh yeah. All right. How we do? Right. And then Philip, you want to bring this one up? Yep. Yeah. You always knew there was going to be a Geneva cocktail in here somewhere. <laughs> I could be giving a seminar on non-alcoholic drinks and there would be a Geneva cocktail in there. Uh, but it's not just because this is my brand, Old Duff Geneva. Um, this is that cocktail I mentioned earlier, the sort of prototype um, Manhattan. And the purpose of vermouth back then was to water down the straight booze. Because people were beginning to realize you can't drink straight booze all the time, right? And the early recipes for the Martinez slash Manhattan slash uh, Turf Club were either 50-50 vermouth and whiskey or Geneva, or two parts of vermouth to one part of Geneva. And literally the first thing I did when Andy gave me a bottle of Cuchello Rosso five years ago was mix it with this. So this is two parts of rye, one barley, five day fermentation, three times through, the pot still, and then just a tiny bit of juniper and a tiny bit of English hops. There's only 300% malt wine Genevers like this left in the whole world. And yet, every single recipe for gin in a cocktail in the world's first cocktail book from 1862 was talking about Geneva like this. America's first distillery was built on Staten Island trying to make this, right? And this eventually led to the birth of rye whiskey. So without this, no uh, boulevardiers or other delicious cocktails. So two parts of Rosso, one part of malt wine Geneva, a bar spoon of something you're, yes? Yes. <laughs> no, seriously, really. No, seriously, really, yeah. Um, a bar spoon of something, thank you. Uh, European and expensive. It could be maraschino. Sometimes it's curacao. Uh, in some recipes, it's absinthe. But so long as it's European, fancy, and a bit sweet, it goes in. Um, 
I, I think Luxardo's fantastic stuff. It really is. But I use stock maraschino uh, at home and I recommend it to you. It's a little less violety, flowery type stuff. And it's also 80 proof. And then three dashes of Angostura aromatic bitters. Uh, this is best if you make it in your bars. I know that many of you do. Thank you. Uh, lemon zested. It really supercharges this drink. And then the cherries are just there for a garnish. So cheers everybody. I really feel this shows off Coachella Rosso really well. Mm. Ah. And I'm kind of glad we batched full-size cocktails. So at least we have a half-size cocktail for everybody. We thought originally 15 people would show up. Uh, first of all, a round of applause for everybody who's helped us out so well here today at Patent Pending. Uh, words to the wise, if you don't know, uh, the new project at the Renwick Hotel on 40th Street, Agency of Record, uh, can be popped into right now. Gorgeous, massive DJ, restaurant, bar, highly recommended from the people who brought you Patent Pending. Uh, I would like to say thank you to Andy and Lorenzo, but especially somebody that I want to get up here. Uh, she's been instrumental in organizing this. Uh, as I said, their portfolio is great. If you want to pop up here, try a bit of vermouth, try a bit of mezcal. Uh, Sarah, do you want to close us down here a little bit? Yes. Because otherwise I'll talk all afternoon. It's, it's well known. Honestly, <laughs> who's thanked you? Except for me to thank you. Thank no, you so you. much. Only you. Thank Sarah. you. Thank you. Thank you, honestly. Honestly, phenomenal, great job. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you to all of you for all your support, your attention. Um, honestly, we would not be here and as happy as we are if you didn't actually show up. So thank you for showing up on a Monday, nonetheless. Um, yeah, I, there's really nothing more I could say except that there are gift bags at the back. Please message us or message your Blueprint uh, sales rep for pricing on Cochilo or Granja or any other brands that you may have questions on. We appreciate your support through and through. Um, honestly, Andy, thank you so much. Pat and Penning, you guys are fucking phenomenal. Thank you so much. Lorenzo, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.